thus ends the uh, message for today. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming uh, to the end of our Lenten season. Next Sunday will be Palm Sunday, and a week from Thursday, Maundy Thursday, or sometimes called Holy Thursday. Two weeks from today, we will celebrate the most wonderful Sunday of the Christian calendar, the greatest of all Sundays, Easter. It's interesting that today, with Holy Week and Easter so close at hand, we have one of the longest of the lectionary series, 45 verses from the 11th chapter of John's Gospel. You're welcome, Grant. <laughs> for many preachers, this scripture passage has enough material for several Sundays. Nevertheless, it tells just one long extended story. Normally, the Gospels pack any number of healings or parables or, or miracles or conversations into a lesson as long as this one. But here we have just one incident in several parts. I'm going to focus on a single phrase, something near the end of the story that Grant read. In the language of the Common English Bible, the phrase reads, Jesus shouted with a loud voice. Similar to what the choir was saying about the stones shouting out. Our scripture lesson is a beautiful, exciting story but one that has some strange elements when you stop to think about it. Jesus had a special friendship with a family of siblings in a village of Bethany, two miles from Jerusalem. The family, family of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. These three folks were very dear to Jesus, and he seemed to find a lot of security in their home and in their hospitality. One day, as our reading reports, Lazarus became ill. The Bible doesn't say what the illness was, only that the sisters, Mary and Martha, knew that it was pretty serious, and they sent news to Jesus. They didn't ask Jesus to come, they simply told him that Lazarus was ill. They seemed to have such confidence in Jesus' friendship that they were sure he would come simply upon learning of the illness without being specifically asked to do so. Jesus, in turn, knew that they were expecting him to come. But listen to the way John tells it. Though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. John wants us to know that Jesus is acting a little out of character here. He loves these three folks, but when he learns that they need him, he didn't respond immediately. He stays right where he is for two extra days. John doesn't excuse Jesus by telling us what Jesus was doing and, and therefore justifying his delay. When Jesus did decide to go to Bethany to be with his friends, he knew that Lazarus was already dead. And he told his disciples that. By the time Jesus and his disciples got to Bethany, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Now we need to remember, a little history here, that the Jews did not embalm. They buried quite soon after a death sometimes even in the same day, but always within 24 hours. The mourning, however, continued for days. In the first century world, funerals carried a lot of social significance. Therefore, to be sure that there was a proper expression of sorrow, there were paid mourners who were trained to show grieving in dramatic ways. No reason for any unemployment problems there. What a job that must have been. In addition to these paid mourners, it seems that many from the community were at Martha and Mary's residence, paying their respects. Most likely the people in that area felt special sympathy for the two sisters in 
the loss of their brother. <coughs> Apparently Mary and Martha and Lazarus had no other relatives, so they were close and very dependent on each other and on their neighbors in this small town of Bethany. Therefore the whole village and the surrounding countryside shared in their grief. So when Jesus and his disciples arrived, though Lazarus had been dead for four days, the mourning, the grieving, was still going on full blast. Martha was the first to greet Jesus. And their conversation is very significant. Martha greeted Jesus with a reprimand. Lord, if you had been here, my, mother, my brother would not have died. And she added that she knew, she just knew, that even now, whatever Jesus asked of God, God would give him. But when Jesus answered, your brother shall rise again, Martha quickly made it clear that she wasn't expecting any miracle. She answered, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Ah, but Jesus answered, I am the resurrection and the life. Therefore, Jesus continued, anyone who believes in him will never die. Now, that's kind of hard to understand, especially in light of our small group session where we learned just last Wednesday night that we are supposed to die every day. Jesus is saying, anyone who believes in him will never die. This sentence was a challenge to Martha. It wasn't the kind of sentence you could just drop casually into any conversation. And even if Martha had wanted to avoid the issue that the sentence implied, Jesus wouldn't let her. He demanded a response to the outrageous thing he had just said. Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this? We judge from the way the Bible reports the conversation that Martha did not hesitate to answer. Actually, all she needed to say was yes. Jesus had asked a yes or no question, so Martha could have said only one word, yes, or maybe yes, I believe. Instead, Martha was quite a theologian, a Bible scholar. And she answered like a Bible scholar, not a theologian, or a Bible scholar trained in a university or a seminary, and not a theologian in a library surrounded by books, but she answered as a kitchen theologian, because it was in her kitchen that Martha had studied theology. Martha was a serving woman theologian, a village woman theologian, a woman at the market type theologian. Now, I don't mean to discredit scholarly theologians because we owe a lot to such learned teachers. But let's be clear that Christian theology is at its best in the marketplace and in the school classroom and at the company office and the local restaurant and the dinner table and yes, in the kitchen. And it's the kind of theology that works when you're sick and when you're tired, and when you're, you've won a ball game and you need to know there's more to life than a ball game, or when you've lost a ball game, Wisconsin fans, and you need to know that there's more to life than a ball game. We sense all of this in Martha's grand extended answers. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, then asked Martha if she believed that. Martha, the kitchen theologian, answered, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. She gave Jesus the answer he wanted, even, even more than he had ex reason to expect. If faced with a similar situation, could we do anything less than what Martha has done? Let's recall that what Martha said to Jesus is essentially what 
Peter said when he made the statement that Jesus is the foundation on which the church is built. The declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Matthew 16, 16. Martha's statement was especially strong since she referred to the fulfilling of the Hebrew scriptures. And we need to remember this. Martha made her declaration in the face of deep tragedy and sorrow, the loss of her brother. She affirmed the identity, the deity of her Lord at this very difficult time and place of loss, tragedy, sorrow. Now Mary joins the scene along with a bunch of Lazarus' friends. They're all weeping, and Jesus weeps with them. Then Jesus insisted on going into the tomb where they had laid the body of his friend Lazarus. Martha urges him not to go there. She says, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead for four days. Obviously, Martha was not expecting any miracle. I'm guessing she thought that Jesus only intended to pay his respects and to make a last act of love and friendship. But as we know, Jesus had more in mind. First he prayed so that all those folks gathered around could hear him. And then the reading says, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come out. And Lazarus, wrapped in the very claws of death, rose up. Of course, it was a sensation in the town, and the word spread quickly. Especially the word reached Jerusalem, just two miles away. Jesus' enemies saw this as the last straw. They felt now, more than ever, that they've got to get rid of this man named Jesus. Because obviously the people were being drawn to him, now more than ever. They even talked about maybe killing Lazarus again. Because his presence was now walking, talking, undeniable evidence of Jesus' power. It was not many days later that the enemies of Jesus got together for the trial and execution of our Lord. Let's pause for a moment in that phrase in the Lazarus story that tells us that Jesus went to the tomb and shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Why did Jesus shout? Obviously, John thought it was an important detail. So why did he shout? Well, I wish I had a good answer for that question, but we really don't know. But this we do know. When Jesus and Martha were talking earlier, Martha announced her faith in Jesus as the Son of God. And when she did, that was very loud. I'm not talking about the volume of her voice. Martha had a very strong faith. And when she declared her faith in Jesus, she spoke with a voice that shook the world, shook the gates of hell. Jesus had come to Bethlehem to work a miracle. But he was always looked, he also was always looked for faith for, from those around him. And when Martha declared her faith in Jesus' divinity, I think she empowered the Lord. She encouraged him even more. So we don't know why Jesus spoke with a loud shout at the tomb of Lazarus, but we should be very impressed with Martha's declaration. We don't know how loud she spoke, but when she did, Jesus most certainly heard a loud shout. May it be so with you and me as we speak of our Lord during these last few days of Lent.
If you have any prayer requests, I encourage you to pray them for or send them forth with an usher as we stand and sing together.